three, two, one, and we're live. All right, everyone, welcome back to my show. Uh, I am joined today by an esteemed guest, Dr. Andrew Mazaros. I'm going to briefly introduce him before we bring him in. Uh, Dr. Mazaros completed his B.A. in Philosophy and Theology at Boston College in 2007. He completed his master's degree at the University of Oxford, 2009, and the Catholic University of Louvain, 2010, where he later completed his doctorate in 2014. He spent one year doing postdoctoral research at the University of Vienna between 2015 to 2016 before coming to Maynooth. He specializes in uh, the development of Catholic theology in the 19th and 20th centuries, Aquinas and his interpreters and influence in the same period, pre-conciliar movements and debates on ecclesiology, eschatology, and fundamental theology, neo-scholasticism and nouvelle theologie, and the thought of John Henry Newman and the Oxford movement. Dr. Andrew, thank you so much for coming on. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Eric. Appreciate it. Yes, yes. So the way I got in contact with you was uh, I was I was uh, I was going back and forth with Dr. Matthew Levering uh, because I had been really intrigued by his book uh, on the, the recent one that was published by Word on Fire: Newman and Doctrinal Corruption. And uh, I noticed that you were in the footnotes, <laughs> so um, I I I wanted to, you know, get to know your material uh, because I saw that's where he was drawing some of his, and uh, sure enough, he he deferred to you as you know as someone who has been, has specialized here and is and would be worth uh, corresponding with. So he's actually the reason how why I reached out to you because I was. I was originally going to have uh, Dr. Matthew Levering on, um, but he's a really busy guy. And the focus that I brought my questions to, he thought you would be a better fit. So um, that's why I uh, that's why I reached out to you. <laughs> that's no, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Matthew Levering is a he's, he's very generous. Uh, you would if, if you could get him on, that would still be great because. Uh, oh, yeah, he's. He's yeah. he's masterful on basically every subject. Yeah, but, um, he is. He he is. Yeah, he, he's he's written a very good book, and he was always quite concerned whether or not he's kind of uh, graduated into Newman studies, as it were. But I assured him that he has, because it is an excellent book, and I would recommend it to everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He what I what I like the most about Levering is that when he writes, you could tell that he doesn't leave any rock on touch Uh, he uncovers every rock as much as he can um even if it doesn't seem like it's relevant he he does all this reading and it's just quite impressive so absolutely yeah but anyway um so what uh tell us a little bit about your upbringing like where you're from and how did you get introduced to the catholic church are you cradle catholic or did you come later in life uh etc etc sure so I, I'm uh, I'm American. I live in Ireland right now, but I'm from Cleveland, Ohio originally. Okay. I was born and raised there. I was uh, I was brought up in a bilingual household, or I should say, uh, a Hungarian Catholic household. So I was cradle Catholic. Uh, my grandparents came over from Hungary in 1951 after the Second World War. Uh, so my parents they they talked to me in Hungarian growing up in the house, uh, and then I got the English in in school. Um, but we went to both like the local parish where I had the Catholic school, but there was also a Hungarian Catholic community as well. So I, we would kind of oscillate between the communities. Um, so I was raised Catholic, um, went to Catholic school, uh, grade school, Jesuit high school, St. Ignatius high school in Cleveland, uh, and then kind of kept going, uh, did by undergraduate at Boston college. Uh, and then at, already in high school, I kind of knew that I wanted to study philosophy, at least philosophy and theology. Uh, they gave us Peter Crave to read freshman year in high school. Uh, yeah. yeah, this little book, Yes or No. And after that, I already realized, like, I want to study philosophy. And so then I decided I'm going to go to Boston College and I'm going to um, listen to Peter Crave teach me philosophy. And that was great. But uh, 
but but back to your question, like I, I never had any significant doubts about the faith. Uh, obviously, when you grow up, you rationalize things and you and you and you test things and you see like, you know, is this really right or is that does this make sense? But uh, I would say by the time uh, confirmation rolled around, we had to do some retreats, and it was through the retreats that uh, I could say I truly appropriated what I was given. Um, but that, that was really just a, a more interior existential appropriation. It wasn't um, a, a major kind of uh, metanoia or something like that. Like I, I never right. really significantly doubted the faith. So I, in that sense, that's, that was a great blessing. And at Boston College, was that um, was that any bit of a challenge? I know because sometimes, you know, um, in some of these higher institutions, especially nowadays, they're kind of, um, you know, without even knowing it, it seems like a t people take it for granted in these higher institutions that, you know, the Catholic Church, you know, basically changed all of its teachings and now we're open to the new. Um, I don't know if, if your experience at Boston College, how was that? Was it a very good experience? I think overall it was excellent. Now every, every, every one of these major, bigger Catholic institutions will have uh, f figures who you know, you, you'll disagree with them. Uh, right. They might misrepresent the church's teachings, etc. But yeah. uh, overall, if you were if you were a practicing Catholic and you wanted to cultivate your faith on campus, it wasn't given to you like it would be at some of these other smaller Catholic universities or Catholic colleges. But if you sought it out, you could you could live an authentic Catholic life. But you did have to seek it out, uh, and there were some excellent people on campus, uh, teachers, mentors. Uh, just to mention too, in philosophy, I would, in addition to Peter Crave, Father Ronald Ticelli was a, a great, a great mentor, uh, as was in theology, Father Robert Mbelli, uh, who's an, who's an excellent theologian and an excellent priest. He's now emeritus. But, uh, if you, if you came under the influence of the right people, I think you could really flourish there. Wow. That's excellent. Yeah. So anybody who's listening and, uh, looking into, uh, getting a education at a, an official institution for Catholic theology. Definitely look up those names, look up their material and see, uh, uh, look into to, uh, Boston college. Now, um, now you, you, uh, knew from high school that you wanted to study philosophy. Um, was that pretty constant throughout your time at college before going to grad school? Yeah, I would say once, once, uh, so my, I was blessed to have excellent, uh, high school. It was, uh, all boys, Catholic college prep, uh, but it really took its Catholic identity seriously. Um, and so every single one of my theology teachers, you would say at the high school level were really excellent. And they, they tried to explain the church's teaching, um, according to the intention of the church and the mind of the church. Um, we had, you know, there was a confession at least every month there were monthly masses, if not more frequent, there were retreats. Um, so they really cultivated the Catholic faith there. And so already my freshman year, I knew this is something I was interested in. The real question was, is would I, would it just be philosophy or would it be philosophy and theology or something else or political science maybe? So then by the time you get to BC, you have to do a core curriculum and you have to do a, a wide range of stuff. And so you did the philosophy theology. And then at that point I, I realized I had to narrow it down. And then some older students uh, told me wisely that if I wanted to do theology, I should stick with the philosophy and make sure I majored in philosophy. And then you could always take on theology later or you could minor in it. Um, so I made sure that I did the philosophy. And then I ended up minoring in theology uh, before I went on to do graduate studies. Mm. And um, in, in graduate studies, um, did you take up any kind, any particular focus in within philosophy um, that uh, helped you in the long run? Yeah, I think at, at that point I, I had kind of transferred over to theology by the time I went to. So I I, I went over to Oxford. Um, I, when I was at an undergrad, I did one year my junior year abroad. I did it in Oxford, and that's where I really got to know John Henry Newman actually. And then I went back to BC, finished the senior year. Uh, and then reapplied for the master's degree in theology, the MPhil in doctrine there. And uh, and that's when I went over to, to Oxford. And uh, at that point, I was already in theology, but always kind of still still reading, trying to keep up with, with philosophy. What philosophy I was doing, I was trying to just 
brush up primarily on like scholastic foundations and everything that I felt was uh, was yeah. taught that I wanted to just get a better better grasp of. You know, that was what I was doing on the philosophy side, just to supplement what I was doing theologically. But I was pretty busy as it was uh, with the other stuff. So now was Oxford what you expected it to be? Um, how was that experience to me? I feel I would be I'd be so pumped up to go there. Yeah. So when when I went when I first went there uh, as a junior, I was at this little college called Harris Manchester College, uh, and that, that was great. Now you have to remember, like junior year, you're twenty, you're maybe twenty years old or something like that. Right. Uh, and so like, but it, at BC, you're kind of if you wanted to get like a beer or something, you'd have to kind of tiptoe through the tulips, you know. Whereas uh, <laughs> <laughs> in Oxford, you just rack up to like I showed up my first night. I just rack up to a pub and got a pint. You know, it was just this <laughs> feeling of liberation. You know, uh, that, that's course, so it's cool. All, it's all a bit kind of it's it's obviously a medieval town, and so sure. um, dreams inspires and it inspires uh, for those reasons. Um, but then, like as as, as you kind of live there, it's, it becomes so magical, and uh, and, and you kind of walk the same halls as people. You visit Christ Church and uh, or you know John Locke studied here or you know you yeah. visit Trinity and like John Henry Newman he was an undergrad here and um, you, you go to instead Blackfriars the chapel and you see on the right hand side they have St. Dominic of Pistachio St. Dominic but he's got the star in his head he's like that's where you know that's where Tolkien got this the star for Aragorn and stuff like that you know wow so it's just it's a magical place yeah you know some people um, they kind of uh look at me weird when i tell them and i've actually never traveled ab abroad i've only traveled uh with you know within the states and the united states uh been you know puerto rico um i've done a couple of cruises in the caribbean but i they asked me where would i really want to go if i go um over the pond over the atlantic and uh, people are they would think oh well obviously you're going to want to go to rome and florence and milan and and uh, maybe to Greece, and I really want to go to those areas. Uh, but from all of my uh, experience with people giving me their testimonies from going to Europe, uh, going to Oxford, going to uh, England, and exploring that territory, you know, the land of Lewis and the land of Chesterton, and just the 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 historic. Uh, breadth of the intellectual tradition um has such a remarkable you know panorama of uh of history there and so i i always say i'd want to go there first <laughs> yeah no I, yeah I, I i love my time there but i know the second time was a bit different because that then it was more serious when you go there for a junior abroad i mean you have to study you have to write your essays but at the end of the day it's kind of a new exciting thing the second time I was there, I was doing the two-year MPhil, and that at that point I was at Blackfriars Hall, and uh, and there was there's it was a bit more um, serious. There was a more maturity about it in my approach, uh, uh, but it was still it was still kind of uh, a dream experience. Insofar as that's where I met my my future wife, she was also studying there. She was doing the MST as well, and uh, she was at Trinity. I was at Blackfriars, and we started dating, and now we're married and we have kids. But so it's it's, it's a lovely little story, but. Uh, in all in every respect uh those are some of the best years of my life yeah it sounds like it that sounds magical like you said but uh so what got you into saint john henry newman yeah so uh as i said when, when i was in oxford that's when i was i first actually read him when i was in oxford but i suppose what i liked about him was the a his story it's a good story like the conversions is just a um highly entertaining i like his polemics i like his arguing i like his style uh but i suppose one of the reasons why is because growing up in cleveland you're i, I was always exposed to different kinds of christians uh mostly evangelical or protestant um so for example in my in my youth group we would go on mission trips and we would um it, some of it was quite ecumenical so we would help we would go to so for example mexico and we would help orphans there um but some of them would have been Catholic. Some of them wouldn't have been Catholic. Um, and then one of the retreats I went to when I found my faith, it was actually um, like one of these evangelical retreats. It was called Youth Explosion. Uh, and they had the curtain call and everything, right? Uh, and yet uh, I always felt on the one hand, 
I thought that there's something going on here that's real and true. And at the same time, I know there's something, I, I think there's something wrong with it. And why is it the case that I was raised one way in this faith? And uh, there are these other people who pray differently, who believe different things. Uh, and so that was always a cause of, it always caused some curiosity or elicited curiosity in me. And I wanted to know more about it. And so uh, Newman was one way into understanding the differences. And so uh, when I went to Oxford for my junior year abroad, I started, I did an entire a trimester of essays on on Newman and the Oxford movement. And that's when I really got into him. So then when I went back to BC and finished up, I knew like this is someone who I'm going to keep reading, you know, probably for the rest of my life. And then uh, by the time, then when I went back to Oxford for the MPhil, I had to figure out a, a topic uh, to write my, my MPhil dissertation on. And uh, so I had the idea maybe of doing something on uh, on 20th century perceptions of, of Newman and how Newman became influential in the 20th century. So then I decided on uh, Congar and Newman on tradition. And then that that was for the film that just blossomed into the, the doctorate and the book. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, okay, so that's that answers how you got into Newman. Now, you know, uh, he's such a popular figure. And um, what I've learned, you know, when I first came into the church in 2000, uh, at the end of 2012, um, was there's a lot to t there's a lot to say about Newman on the surface level, um, but then there's so much more <laughs> yeah. uh, when you study the history of who he is and his thought. Um, and we talk about the Oxford movement, the Tractarians, and and these things. Can you? Um, and, and I know that we could we could speak hours about the Oxford movement, but um, if I could ask you to do the impossible, uh, could you explain just the what is the apex of, uh, you know, what was the apex of the Oxford movement? What was its cause and its pursuit? And um, how did that lead to Newman's eventual turning point? As as we all know, my audience is very familiar of his conversion in 1845, but but they may, they may not know exactly what the Oxford movement is. We talk about it so often, but um, how little do we actually know what it was? Sure. No, that's, that's a great question. Uh, and there, there are people who can answer probably even better than I can who've written whole books just on the movement itself. Oh, yeah. I have uh, a whole bunch of books on it. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, in brief, in brief, it was basically uh, a, a movement within Anglicanism in the 19th century that sought to revitalize or to refine its the, the Anglican Church's apostolic foundations. Uh, to put in layman's terms, it was trying to kind of re-Catholicize the Anglican Church away from its continental Protestant aberrations on the one hand and the, the liberalism of the day that was reigning. By liberalism, I mean a certain kind of flippancy or indifference to doctrine, uh, to making uh, doctrinal truth claims. And so there was there was a certain a sense that uh, the established church was uh, becoming too liberal. And so uh, in order to kind of revitalize its Catholicism, its apostolic foundation, the dogmatic principle, as Newman calls it, uh, this this Oxford movement basically started in the early, I would say, late 1820s, um, and, and precisely in order to do this. And so then they started writing what they called tracts or essays to try to explain uh, the, the, the apostolic foundations of the church to basically show that the Anglican church is not just one church among many or one community among many, but that it's the successor of the one church of Christ, uh, which is the apostolic Catholic church. And it happens to be, so the claim went that the Anglican church is the, is the Catholic church in England. Uh, and it's when they start, and the, as Newman started writing about this, um, then when, then, certain difficulties started to creep up, you could say, you know, and that, that eventually led to his conversion. And I can talk about those if you want, but, uh, but yeah. in a sense that I think that's kind of a simple answer to what the Oxford movement was. So they started doing things like uh, auricular confession, for example, was instituted, right. you know, and um, celebrating the Eucharist more regularly, uh, more in accord with, with which rule, um, question of baptismal regeneration came up it you know do they believe for example that you know pouring the water actually does something in the act or is it just kind of like a calvinistic kind of symbol that happens right. that's, that shows something that already happened you know previously 
Sure. Um, th- so these kind of controversies came up and they tended to side with uh, a more patristic and Catholic interpretation on these questions. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, I um, when I when I've read on the Oxford movement and the Tractarian pursuits, um, I, I've, I've always tried to summarize it into a few words. And, and to me, it, it's, it's almost impossible to do, but it's exactly as you just did briefly. And, and that is they were trying to um, they were they were trying to show uh, or, you know, reinvigorate the patristic consciousness of the church, you know, but they were also trying to make sure that they had a way um, to absolutize Christian doctrine so that it didn't, you know, didn't run the risk of being, um, you know, changed and played around with like the contemporaries around them were trying to do. And um, in my reading of Newman, that seems to be one of the things that drove him, you know, um, and I, I maybe maybe you've read a little bit about from his pre-Catholic writings, but um, let me ask you this: Were there any writings that you read about read from Newman before he became a Catholic, um, where he was critical of the Catholic Church? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So yeah. I mean, some of his some of his Anglican writings are quite polemical. Uh, yeah. So they're quite critical of you know, Romanism, as it were. And that usually, you usually see that, for example, in his his book on the prophetical office of the church. Yeah. Um, he, he's trying to, in the in his mature Anglic Oxford movement stage, we're talking, you know, uh, mid to late 1830s, um, he's, he's carving out his via media. So he's basically right. saying, I'm not, I'm not a continental Protestant. Uh, because they're basically they have they're they're not heirs to the apostolic church, uh, but I'm not Roman either because they're they have corruptions and they they've basically um, gone too far in terms of their superstition and their rituals and everything like that. So what I'm advocating, Newman speaking in the late 1830s, I'm I'm carving out the Via Media, the middle way between these two false extremes. And when he tries to carve out this this side, he has to show the heirs of both, and so then he actually does end up being. Um, quite critical of Romanism um, or the Roman system, as it were. Yeah, and interestingly enough, you know, when I read when when I was reading that particular uh, text, um, I noticed that he found a sharp axe um, to swing with against Catholicism in Saint Vincent de Lorenz, um, the you know the the Vincentian <coughs> canon. You know, we believe. We, that that is Catholic, which has been believed uh, always, everywhere, and by all people. And and for, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but at at first, you know, the way he was using Saint Vincent was kind of to show how Romanism doesn't pass that test because of all the new stuff um, that that was not universal. That's right. So I mean, as as an Anglican, he was at the time basically saying if I, we're all looking for kind of a norm for what we believe. And during that time, he was, he was kind of looking to the church, a consensus in the church fathers uh, to understand, like w- once we have the consensus, that's the norm. So if we want to figure out what the Catholic faith is, we look at the consensus and that's where the Vincentian canon comes in. Uh, it's, it's believed by all it's universal. It's been there always by believed by all everywhere. And so we can establish this historically. So we we hit the books, we do our homework, and then once we've done our homework, uh, we can discover through historical work what the apostolic consensus was or the patristic consensus was. And then once we have established that consensus, then we know, for example, we have a measure, and then anything that doesn't measure up to that consensus, such as the Roman system with, uh, you know, relics or purgatory or whatever it is, indulgences, yeah. Yeah, indulgences, all that stuff. Uh, these these are these are not developments. They're corruptions. Uh, they go beyond the consensus, and therefore, uh, there, there's a corruption. Yeah, and um, you know, could you tell us a little bit about um, how his mind adapted from that? Because you know, he made a transition at some point where uh, he, he basically saw that uh, some of the things that Anglicans cherish as dogmatic um, 
doesn't nearly pass the test either. And so he had to sort of uh, think of a way to explain the progress of doctrine, um, which may, you know, this is kind of like the elementary precursors to his uh, essay on the development. Yeah. So as you say, uh, you know, he was always preoccupied with trying to solve a problem. And one of the major problems he noted was not only that doctrine changes over time, uh, but that there are disagreements. Yeah. And so um, in the original, when, when people would ask, well, how does the church come to teach X, you know, in the third or the, in the fourth century or the fifth century, um, to take just one example, say the homoousion at Nicaea, uh, his early answer in the 1830s was the idea of the disciplina arcani, the disciplina arcani, according to which it's like a secret discipline, according to which uh, if, you, if, if we don't know, if we don't know about something or if we haven't read it about something or if someone is silent about something, it's not because they didn't believe it, but it's because they believed it, but they just didn't actually, um, out of a certain kind of discipline, uh, they didn't actually say it publicly. And so there was a kind of an oral tradition um, and that only when it was questioned did it actually uh, have to be defined and articulated and expressed publicly. Uh, but th that theory um, was highly unpopular, even among some of Newman's own peers, the, the people with whom he respected a great deal. And then he also had to confront the fact that uh, there were just disagreements. Uh, and so the discipline of Arcani didn't actually work because you realize, uh, if you read like the Acta of any council or the history of a council, you come to realize that the, what they end up defining is uh, is the result of a lot of back and forth. It's not the case that they came together and decided, okay, now's the time to kind of put forth what we are all keeping secret, but rather now's the time that we're, we're, we're arguing now. And uh, at Chalcedon, like you guys don't want to change the creed. We do want to change the creed. So what are we going to do? And so they come up with a new creed. So the discipline of Arcani didn't really help explain that. Uh, and then back to the canon, it seemed like, okay, well, we can still try to find a patristic consensus, but if you find a patristic consensus that excludes Roman stuff, then it's so tight, you, you narrow it down, the interpretation of the, of the Vincentian canon, that you actually don't leave any room for the things that Anglicans believe. So Newman <laughs> basically says, look, we, we Anglicans, we believe in the Athanasian Creed, right? But like the Athanasian Creed didn't pop out of the sky. And so that way you need to broaden the canon to embrace the Athanasian Creed. Mm -hmm. But once you broaden it to embrace the Athanasian Creed, what's to stop you from embracing Trent? Right. So that, that, that kind of got the, the ball rolling in terms of questioning where he was at in terms yeah. of his own the theorizing. I suppose then the, 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 the next question was, well, if, uh, if my own theology is not explaining the change um is my own church explaining the change or is, or is is my ecclesial status in some way um helping in this regard and there he this was also coinciding at a time when he gradually came to recognition that uh the anglican church's claim to catholicism wasn't actually wasn't actually uh credible anymore and the two things the two major things that kind of pushed him over the edge was when he the track 90 where you tried to interpret the anglican articles the 39 articles of the anglican faith um he tried to inter give a catholic interpretation of it and he was basically condemned for it by the anglican bishop so he's basically told that's not possible uh and then the second thing was the uh the the, the jerusalem bishopric whereby the the established church cooperated with the prussian lutheran church uh in order to uh, cooperate and establish together a joint Episcopal see in Jerusalem. And so we thought here, here's my Anglican church um, trying to be in communion with the Lutherans. So therefore, uh, whatever I once thought about the Anglican church, I don't, I don't think that they're really actually Catholic anymore. And so then the search that that's when he calls that led to his deathbed on the side of the church of England. And so then um, that was just a few short years later where, um, where he actually ends up converting. But in the meantime, uh, as you note, uh, he starts thinking about development more, and he writes a famous sermon, one of his university sermons, the last sermon, 15. Uh, I think that's published in 1843. And then uh, a few short years later, 
um, he begins writing the essay on development. And this is already after he's retired from his position at Oxford. And uh, he's all quiet, uh, isolated in Littlemore uh, and writing this essay, trying to figure things out. And before he finishes writing the essay on development, um, he decides to be received into the church. Yeah. Have you visited uh, Littlemore, the place there? I, I have. I have. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I've seen it. I've seen a lot of YouTube videos of it, and and people doing interviews there, uh, Dr. Ian Kerr and um, some others. Um, so yeah, so this is that 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 point you made about where he was he was finding these inconsistencies of how you know you strength you know you you restrict things just so that only the Anglican things are being preserved, but 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 when you restrict it that much, there's no there's no basis for it. So then you got to you got to open it up again, and then Catholicism starts flowing in um, because of all the you know the the um, like I know that one doctrine he saw that was extremely early was uh, um, the doctrine of purgatory or the or, you know post mortem satisfaction. Um, you know that was just all over the place, and even more than original sin. I think in the essay he says that um, original sin is an unquestionable doctrine for the Anglicans, but it has actually less um, matter when it comes to database, uh, database of texts in the patristics than other doctrines that the Catholic Church believes. So when I saw that, I, 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 I felt like I was on cloud nine. You know, when, he, when, he, when, he taught, when he taught me how to think that way, it was just I, I felt like uh, Newman caught something that not many people can catch um, with, with where he was. But so that moves us to the next thing here. So we covered a little bit about the Oxford movement. Uh, we covered a little bit about Newman and his uh, precursors to his thought and the essay when he starts to write it in isolation um, after his term at Oxford. Um Today, amongst Catholics, Protestants, and Eastern Orthodox, um, this in popular apologetics, uh, what seems to be what seems to happen nowadays is that, um, and I, I don't feel bad saying Protestants and Orthodox do this, because enough Orthodox specialists, even in academia, still tend to do this. Um, so both. Eastern Orthodox and Protestants, they'll they'll go into history, church history, and they'll find all kinds of discontinuities between the early church and the medieval Catholic Church, even the Catholic Church of today. And the Catholic will turn around and just kind of throw down the card, like, well, Newman, you know, like development of doctrine. So doctrinal development and, uh, you know, Protestants and Catholics are now st starting to l laugh at this a little bit because they, they think it's just a way of taking two things that don't have any relationship. And then all of a sudden they can just magically be reconciled with each other. Um, what would you say, you know, is, is, what would you say about Newman's thought on this topic of doctrinal development that would sort of um, satisfy the curiosities of some of those who are worried about this? You know, that it's it's like we're just throwing down the Newman card as if the, <clears throat> Newman can just patch anything together. Um, doesn't matter how antithetical they are. Um, what would you say? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Well, a, a few things, I suppose, n none of which are altogether straightforward, but I would begin with this, that uh, any kind of facile appeal to Newman only gets you so far. And not only, right. it's not just that, I mean, Catholics do it who are trying to answer, say, a, a Protestant or an Orthodox, but Catholics also do it, for example, when they're, you know, pining for some change in the church's teaching on something. Yes. And yep. they'll say, yep. well, Newman and doctrinal development, so why not, you know? Right. And, uh, and that, that's not all what Newman was about, right? So his whole point was to say, how do we make sense of previous doctrinal developments or previous changes? How do we interpret that? And it was a way of making sense of something that already happened it, and, and to show the continuity between the changes rather than 
uh, how do we how do we how do we find a way of kind of changing things now? That's not that's not what his question was, and that's not what the theory right. was meant to be. But I mean, back to back to the question. Uh, so, like, j just saying Newman's not going to cut it. Uh, but I think what is important to note is that what Newman is trying to do is uh, sh show the continuity in terms of the intelligibility between what was antecedently there and what is now presently being taught. And his claim, and this is an acknowledgement of the validity of the question being asked of Catholics, he's acknowledging that there ought to be some kind of intelligible way of showing that one thing follows from the other. So he's not saying, oh, we're not saying oh, it's a bad question or that's an irrelevant question. It's a good question if you're asking, how is it the case that this church that looks completely different now than what it looked like, say, 2,000 years ago, uh, how do you make sense of that? And we have to give an answer. Uh, and, uh, and, and the best answers that can be given have to appeal in some way to theological argumentation. So, and by theological yeah. argumentation, I mean in the broadest sense, um, bo both historical, but also theological in terms of, you know, rational argumentation to show that there really is uh, an, an, uh, an intelligibility to the doctrine such that you can actually take and extract what is implicit in something and make it explicit later on. And you can show that argumentative or through through argument, through through rational reflection. Now, some people might not always agree with those arguments. They might not accept them always. But, uh, but what the Catholic is never going to concede is that it's not worth doing or not worth trying to show. And that uh, the theologian, obviously, for the Catholic, has the responsibility to do so. Um, yeah. Otherwise, what you're left with is a certain kind of uh, theological voluntarism whereby you just say, well, we teach this because we want to teach it, or we teach this uh, because we prefer it this way. Uh, or, so you either become a voluntarist or you become kind of a historicist and say, well, we teach this because, you know, it just happens to be that way or because history has moved us in this direction and we can't yeah. really do anything about it. There's no real reasons for it. We're just doing it because of our cultural context or because we're living in the 20th century now. Um, or whatever it is, or because we're Latin, Western, Catholic, or something like that. Um, so you either kind of deconstruct historically, uh, or or you say, well, it's willful, and this is why we teach it. Whereas uh, yeah. the, the, the more kind of sane thing to do, the more Catholic thing to do would be to say, uh, we teach this because it's part of Revelation. And if you don't really see that right now, perhaps we can talk about it and show through argumentation or through history why it is the case or why what we teach now is actually implicit uh in the deposit of faith yeah so so you would say that um newman did not uh introduce the concept uh first of all he didn't we know he didn't introduce the concept he himself already saw uh some of this like a, a for, for example in saint vincent de Lorenz, he saw that uh, there was already a talk about the progress of doctrine but it's not as if newman was trying to devise a way to um take two antithetical things and bridge them together rather he's looking at the historic fact of change and then trying to develop an explanation for it yeah that's right yeah. Which, so he, which is he, interesting he, he says the, the the whole essay is basically um, the development. He says it's a it's a thesis to account for a difficulty, and and the That's difficulty right. he sees are just the variances in the tradition, bishop against bishop, council against council, synod against synod, uh, all the disagreements. And so, how are you going to explain this? And you can you can try to make sense of it by going liberal, and invoking private judgment, and so then you can say, well, uh, it, it it's all so chaotic. Uh, I'll decide then what I think is revelation, right? Uh, but for for Newman, that's anathema, right? Because that yeah. that, that in private judgment basically leads to um, th that basically leads to agnosticism and to infidelity at the end that's of the right. day. Um, yeah. Or or then you can or you can dismiss or you can try to account for the the changes by just saying, well, this is all a historical accident, you know, and uh, and that's obviously as a believer for Newman, that's not a, an adequate. Um, explanation either so you have these facts 
and you have to try to account for the facts. And so the best way he knows how to account for them is to posit the thesis of development. That's right. And this is such an important point because um, often enough, Newman is thought of as a utility for Catholic theology um, on on one side of the spectrum anyway, um, as just sort of like, a, you know, he was just trying to figure out how to justify his conversion to Catholicism. But it's very much different than that. He's looking at the facts of history that the second century Christian society is not a carbon copy image of seventh century Christian society. Um, and if Christianity is going to be a historical fact, like a historical um, something that's a fact of history, um, then we need to make sense of the reality that we see here and which is obvious, and that is that there is change. Um, so it's not something that uh, we can deny. We know that there's change um, because sometimes the Orthodox will, the Orthodox will, especially because Protestants are, are readily spring loaded to, uh, they're ready to say that there was change. That's not a problem. But when, when speaking perhaps with like the Eastern Orthodox or some of the more Oriental Orthodox, um, it's very important for them that there is no change. That the, the tradition is frozen and it's all, um, its dimensions do not augment at all. It's just whatever was handed on is picked up and handed on and picked up and handed on. Um, and it's the same thing. It can't, there's, there's any kind of growth to it can only be language, differenti differentiation and language. Um but Newman's looking at the history and saying, no, there's there's definitely more than just a language change between the early centuries and the Middle Ages. Um, so I think that's important. Now, some some people and, and I came across this idea when I was reading uh, Father Andrew Louth, Luth or Louth, I can't remember. I don't know if it's Luth or Louth, but he's an Orthodox theologian, and he wrote an essay that was compiled in um, a volume uh, dedicated to Jaroslav Pelikan. And in that in that article, you know, he said that one of the problems he had with Newman's essay is that the way that Newman constructed his, you know, the 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 the, the theory on development is um, that it allows for spontaneous developments, you know, developments that are not urged from the, the content of revelation itself, but is just kind of, you know, spontaneous. I can't think of another word. That's just the word that Luth used, and so I think is, is a good one. Ver versus, um, I'm thinking of uh, Owen Chadwick's book on uh, the Bossuet to Newman, where you know he he described how Bossuet thought that there is no development um, that's beyond lo like rigid logical consequence of what's before, and Luth, you know, more contemporary writer, is saying that Newman held allowed for this spontaneous um, additions as long as they cohere, as long as there's coherence, we can add and add and add and add um and so that was his fear of of the of, of adopting uh newman's idea um what do you say about that is that something that we as as followers of newman have to uh, concede that that uh his his you know his theory is open to spontaneous additions or is it um or can we go a little bit closer to the other side where it's the actual, the the substance of the doctrine calls for the development itself? That, that's an excellent question. So I think uh, Andrew Louth is coming from, from a, it's a valid concern, right? By spontaneous, I think what he really means is an unhinged doctrinal development whereby you're actually not necessarily uh, having to root subsequent developments in something that is antecedent to what you're developing. So what, what you're saying now doesn't actually have to be shown to be implicit in what preceded right. it, but rather right. you can, as long as it's kind of uh, fitting, coherent, as you say, uh, 
and and that can be t taken what you what I would call in an unhinged fashion, where it's kind of deracinated, and it's a very loose rule, and so that's a valid concern. Uh, on on Busway's side, uh, th th there are logical theories. Now, I there there are differences in Newman studies, right? Uh, some some people, some Newman people would say no. Uh, Newman Newman's is indeed much more kind of uh, free. Free, it's, it's more, it gives a greater license, greater latitude. It's very flexible and versatile, etc. Uh, and then there are others who I would count myself among the second group who would uh, view Newman's notes right. as highly restrictive, and that uh, and 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 that there there is all something quite logical to them, or there's a certain kind of rational structure to all of them. So all the notes are basically variations on a a theological rigor that is necessary to show the homogeneity between uh the antecedent and the consequent and so uh i would take louth's um his concern seriously but i would say that I, I would defend newman's theory by saying not that it's spontaneous but that if you take the notes seriously they are actually um they're actually conservative and preservative of what I mean, that's one of the actual one of the notes is called conservative action upon the past which is precisely that which preserves the past um but if you take all the other notes into account there are different ways of saying that you have to actually do some logical work on the that raises the question what kind of logic are we talking about and one of newman's notes is logical sequence but when he talks about logical sequence he doesn't mean for example uh, a strict modus ponens uh, syllogism. Now, some syllogisms are true, and sometimes developments work that way. So uh, just as an example, uh, the Council of Ephesus 431 says that uh, Mary is the Theotokos, she is the mother of God, right? And this is a, this is a conclusion. Now, subsequently to theology, we can, we can do the, the theological work to show that that thesis the doctrine that Mary is the mother of God is implicit in the divine maternity of Mary. So Mary is the mother of Christ. Christ is the son of God. Therefore, Mary is the mother of God. Now, we have to understand that in a certain way so that we don't understand Mary to have uh, being the mother of, of, so that we don't understand God as having had, you know, uh, uh, an earthly birth, but only insofar as the incarnation is concerned. He has given his human nature that he assumed uh, he has a, as a human birth with the Virgin. But that's just one example. Another example of, say, a strict logical uh, development is Constantinople III and the two wills of Christ. So Nicaea establishes definitively that God, Jesus Christ is true God and true man. And then Chalcedon also doubles down on it and says he's true man. He has a full human nature. So Apollinarius is, for example, he's wrong. He doesn't just have... Uh, a human body, but no human soul, but he actually has a full human nature. And then if he has a full human nature, he has to have also a human soul and a human will. So then it's a strict deduction from saying that Jesus Christ is true God and true man. And so therefore, because he has, he's one person in two natures, uh, therefore he has to have two wills. So th yeah. that's where kind of a strict, a strict logic is at work. And you can show that, and that's, and that you can show it with quite a bit of rigor. Um, but where, where that kind of very strict deductive rigor um, starts to become somewhat, not completely, but somewhat inadequate, is when we get to some of the later dogmas. Uh, especially, for example, I would say the, the Marian dogmas of the Immaculate Conception, for example, and the Assumption. Uh, and there, I would not concede that it's not logical. I would just say that the kind of logic you need has to be more what what Newman would call more versatile, more or uh, in in the grammar of ascent, for example, he talks about we need sometimes an organ more more flexible, and he refers to it as informal inference. Uh, formal inference being strict syllogisms, whereas uh, informal inference is what he calls accumulation of probabilities. And so if you can accumulate enough probabilities that would indicate or point to a particular conclusion, so one piece of evidence points to a conclusion and another piece of evidence points to the same conclusion, and you, if you keep accumulating these 
these uh, pieces of evidence that point to the same conclusion, then you can, at some point, you make the judgment, that's what Newman calls the illio sense, you make a judgment that this is indeed the case. And so what he uses to kind of explain all sorts of things, the illative sense in the natural world and our everyday life, we use this illative sense. You can apply that same kind of epistemology to the church. Uh, so in the same way that we come to say natural truths, which you might not actually be able to prove, for example, um, you know, how do we know that, uh, I don't know, to take, uh, what is an example here? Like, uh, is Shakespeare the actual author of Hamlet or was it a forgery or something like that? Well, you can say, well, you know, X number of authors say it, these scholars say it, we have some, you know, evidence in uh, certain, in, uh, you know, in certain museums, and we have these and those manuscripts. And, and so you start listing the evidence, and it all points to the conclusion that actually Hamlet is indeed written by Shakespeare, and it's not a forgery by someone else. And in the same way, the church assembles evidence for, say, the Immaculate Conception. And then at some point, the church makes the judgment that pushes it over the edge in terms of it not only being probable, but actually that we're certain of it, that it is indeed a fact. And this is a rational way of working. It's not irrational. It is a rational way of working, but it's not a uh, modus ponens in action. It's a different kind of logic, but it's still logical. It's still rational. Yes. Yeah, that's important. I think it applies to other things too, you know, like, uh, like papal infallibility, for example, you know, that's that might not be a strict logical deduction from prior propositions and data, um, but um, it, it, one of the one of the ideas in Newman also that restricts the process of development is uh, the making the past superfluous. Um, you know, if if a certain development renders the 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 belief of the church in the past um, redundant, like it no longer has an effect, then we can know that that's a corruption, not a development. So, in papal and fell a bit like the papacy. If the papacy is taken as just another another subject in a series of equals his opinion is not essentially different than anyone else's. It just has the label of like honor, like primacy of honor, but that doesn't actually effectually mean anything because all we have to do is go to the next Bishop and his has a substantially the same authority as the Pope's. Well, that makes a redundancy to all this language about primacy and, you know, about a, a principle of unity the power to unify is made superfluous now because it has each, everyone in the series has the same power. <laughs> yeah. um, so that would be like an example where you don't have strict logical deduction, but you have, you have something, there's something that's posited in a new way in order to preserve something that was always held rather than let it fall into super, superfluousness and redundancy. Is that, is that, am I saying something right? Yeah, absolutely. It's also just a way of making sense of a combination of things. But for example, scripture data and how to account for some scriptural passages. Uh, and then if you, so just say, um, you know, Matthew, I think is at 16 and the Petron ministry, for example. But then if you take into account, for example, the needs of revelation, what does it mean to communicate something definitively? Uh, how does it mean to communicate something in history through writing? And would you or would you not need an authority to interpret, for example, writing, or would you or would you not need an authority to establish uh, what is the proper teaching, what is not the proper teaching? It would seem necessary and highly probable that God would foresee and would establish an institution that would actually uh, execute exactly the needs of revelation that he's actually giving. Yeah. In other words, it's highly probable that God would give the church all the means necessary in order to do what God asks of it, namely to accept and hold fast to the revelation that he gives to us. And so that's, that's an argument to say, it's not proving it per se in a strict sense, but it's saying it is highly probable that this would be the case, that God would provide such a means yeah. for the church. And then you look at the evidence and you say, well, there are some scripture passages that would confirm that expectation. And there are some uh, 
historical facts and historical evidence that would confirm such interpretation. There are certain testimonies that would confirm such an interpretation. And so then you build up uh, a certain case, which at some point becomes overwhelming. And, uh, and, and that's when the church then makes a judgment. Well, actually, this is indeed the case. This is the faith that, of the church. This is, this is yes. the right way of interpreting scripture, not because we yeah. want it to be this way, not because it's a historical accident, uh, but rather uh, certain historical circumstances allow us to see or are opportunities for us to see with greater clarity what is actually revealed to us already in the scriptures, primarily uh, in the deposit of faith. Absolutely. That is just perfectly said. It's very well communicated um, and not well understood by a lot of people. Um, and one of the things I appreciate about Newman is that he admitted that there's some difficulties. You know, he even said that um, there are things in history that challenge Catholic dogma. Um, and but what we see is that those challenges can they kind of get swallowed up by these high probabilistic systems that we're talking about here. Um, and so nothing can be proven so rigorously through historical investigation so as to remove every possible doubt imaginable. Um, but there is enough there to show a very clear lean in the direction of Catholic teaching, kind of like what uh, I think it was uh, Blaise Pascal who said that um, for those who are humble or those who have faith, there's enough light to know the truth. But for those who are bent on having a doubt, um, God still leaves it dark enough so that they can persist in their skepticism, you know. So I really appreciate how Newman uh, was open to that. So um, we do have a couple uh, questions here. I'm going to put them up on the screen. Sure. If you want to take a look and see. I don't know if you could read those. If you can't read it on the screen, I could read it to you. All right. Okay. Uh, Dwight Schrute. <laughs> okay. Why was there pushback from his friends when he converted to Catholicism? Yeah. Well, so uh, at the time, most of his friends were obviously Anglican. So they thought that he had gone the wrong way. Uh, they thought that they had made a great mistake. Um, among them, you know, Pusey, for example, uh, who was one of his, his good friends and colleagues at the University of Oxford, um, he, he was quite disappointed in Newman. He thought he went the wrong way. Um, and they actually lost touch for quite a bit of, for a long time. And then, and then they, uh, and then Pusey wrote a pamphlet. I think this was after the definition of the Immaculate Conception of the Irenicons. And he was basically critical of, uh, of, of all things Marian in the church. And he was quite critical. And, and then Newman wrote a response to Pusey again. Uh, now that's, that's a whole other story, but um, essentially uh, I mean, there'll be a fascinating look. I think other people have kind of looked more closely at kind of the fallout, but um, I think it's fairly well established that Newman did lose, at the very least, he lost touch with a lot of people and uh, some friendships that he used to have were actually damaged, if not completely lost. Uh, and then only to then be later, perhaps um, resuscitated uh, years, if not decades later. Excellent. All right, this other one come, came, comes in from John 76. Um, if you can read it. Sure. It says, please pl pl yeah, please explain. Go ahead. Please explain for non-scholars how Newman's writing is informed by empir the empiricist grammar of ideas and impressions versus Thomist realism as stated in his Newman and the Thomistic tradition. Oh, I see. I, okay. I, I would not be able to answer that question. <laughs> right. Okay, uh, I think I think what's being referred to is a, a, a it's an article that I wrote uh, in Nova Vetera, and uh, I try to discuss two different basically um, traditions to doctrinal development. And you have kind of a neo-scholastic tradition on doct doctrinal development, which is a good one and a valid one, and and the Newman the Manian approach. And I try to show that they're actually closer than we think, but that they can still reinforce each other or they can still actually, each side can kind of learn from the other. And in the article, I, I try to basically say that uh, 
there's some kind of historical sensitivity that Newman can offer and informal inference is crucial uh, to making sense of certain dogmatic developments. Uh, but the, the rigor of the neoscholastic concern for rational, for logic and showing the homogeneity is actually crucial for all discourse surrounding doctrinal development today. But uh, back to the, the actual question though was about empiricist grammar. Basically, Newman's epistemology is, um, is, is not scholastic. If, if by scholastic, we mean Thomistic scholastic referring to Aristotle and the interior and the posterior analytics and his metaphysics, um, there's this whole thing about form and essence. And when you come to know something, you know it through abstraction. And so that form uh, is actually imprinted uh, in, in, in the soul and in the intellect. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole, whole way of looking at knowledge, uh, a realist way of knowledge, according to Aristotle and Thomists that is foreign to Newman and Newman was never taught that what Aristotle, he did know, and he was Aristotelian, but he wasn't Aristotelian in terms of his epistemology so much as he was in terms of his virtue ethics and, uh, his appeal to the rhetoric and how we come to know things that way. So, but he was, he didn't read Aristotle's metaphysics. So basically his empiricist grammar, what I mean by that is simply to say that Newman is, in, he's indebted to uh, British empiricism and he uses languages like idea. And it's a, it's a, what that precisely means for Newman when something, when, when a, an idea comes to you, like he calls Christianity an idea and that this idea is impressed upon the imaginations. Uh, and what that means exactly is a little bit ambiguous and it's not always easy to uncover, but uh, to take another example of the difference, Newman uses the imagination a lot uh, and so do scholastics. But when a scholastic uses the word imagination, they mean something very specific. It's a technical word for Aristotle. It's an interior sense whereby you can uh, create an image uh, in the memory or in the imagination, an interior sense. Whereas for Newman, it's a much more loaded term uh, that comes from a romantic, uh, and empiricist and romantic, you know, talk about Locke, talk about Coleridge and all these people. Uh, it's something that actually, it moves you. It can, if something strikes, hits your imagination, it's something that moves the affections and can actually push you to act. Uh, hmm. So that's just another example of where there's two different traditions. He wasn't scholastic in that sense, although he would have respected it, but he wouldn't have been familiar with it. And so when he uses certain words to, from to a scholastic ear, it can kind of sound funny at times. Yeah. If not, sometimes even problematic. Yeah. So Newman has a trouble with abstractions and for a Thomist, uh, we shouldn't have issues with concepts or abstractions, whereas Newman doesn't like generalizations. Mm. Or he, sometimes he talks that way as if he doesn't like absolutes or universals. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, all right. So, um, Dr. Andrew, this was such a great time. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, do, do you have anything uh, published or in the works that um, you could share with the audience about. Um, I could always just link it in the show notes. Oh, sure. Uh, well, I can, I can, wait, hold on. <clears throat> uh, well, this, this, the, the, the book that I published with Oxford University Press. Yes, it's, uh, The Prophetic Church. The yeah. Prophetic Church, History and Doctrinal Development and John Henry Newman, Yves Congar. So that's, that's the one that's out. Um, obviously, th uh, there's loads of articles that I've written. Um, and you can, maybe if you want, you can link to that yeah. over the academia page or whatever. Yeah, but, uh, I, I link. I have a, I have them all copied and pasted, so everyone perfect. Can see. But basically, yeah, I, I, there's two things I'm working on. One is to write another book on Newman, but uh, it's, it'll be on development. But it'll be kind of Newman in the 19th century, Newman in the modernist crisis, uh, Newman at the Second Vatican Council, and then uh, Newman in the contemporary uh, discourses or post-conciliar discourses on doctrinal development, and that'll be wow. partly taking some of the articles that I've already published and writing a few new things, but it's basically to show uh, Newman's relevance both then and now and how that's kind of changed over time. Uh, so that's the one project. And then the, the second one is uh, a book on doctrine, just on doctrine, not any specific doctrine, but just on doctrine and why we need it. It's going to, I hope it's to be a, a little bit more of a popular book where it's basically trying to say that uh, it's trying to respond to, um, certain what I would consider to be attacks on doctrine, like hermeneutical attacks on doctrine. Like we don't actually know what the fathers of Chalcedon said. And so therefore what we say or what we believe is actually 
different from what they believed because we actually can't really know what they actually said because of, you know, the hermeneutical circle and everything. Mm. Um, and then there's all these also pastoral attacks on doctrine, like our pastoral experiences have to take precedence over teaching. And so we can begin to kind of relativize the teaching according to our contemporary experiences. So that's what I call a pastoral attack on doctrine. And I'm trying to respond to some of these attacks on doctrine and then try to show how doctrine itself is actually absolutely vital to uh, our salvation. So it's wow. the, the tentative title is, uh, I, I don't want to give it, I, I'll give it away, I'll teaser. It's meant to, it's called saving doctrine. It's a corny pun. Yeah, because it's kind of yeah. a double meaning. But in any yeah. case, uh, that's, that's the second one. Yeah. That's uh, that you you are landing on something extremely relevant today, um, because we're seeing, like you said earlier, a little bit uh, Newman is being used and weaponized um, to allow for just uh, a lot of corruptive directions, and they they they're they're trying to show that there's already been you know, directions in the past that were monumental that serve as a paradigm for future changes. And it's just really relevant to what's going on today. And uh, I really encourage your work. This is amazing. And uh, I will be reading everything I can from you because um, this is, um, is so pertinent to what we're facing today. And a lot of the questions that are coming up uh in uh in the near future i'm sure are just gonna the this is like right at the bone of so much of the debates today so anyway dr andrew thank you so much for coming on uh and uh i'll definitely put all the links to this in the show notes and uh until next time everyone please like uh subscribe to my channel to help me get to a, a bigger audience and um Hit the notification bell so you get future notifications. And uh, pray for us. Pray for Dr. Andrew for his work. And God bless you all. Thank you very much, Eric. I appreciate it. God bless Thank you. God bless.